This video is kindly sponsored by Star Trek Fleet Command, the free-to-play multiplayer open-world strategy game that's available on both iOS and Android by using my link in the description below. Hey, 42 here. Black holes are regions in space where the pull of gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape. They're the most extreme objects in the entire universe, but describing just how awe-inspiring they are is actually kind of difficult. They simply defy explanation in terms that we humans can understand. Take their size, for instance. Our solar system contains eight planets, five dwarf planets, more than 200 moons, and well north of a million asteroids. That sounds like a lot of stuff, right? And it is, but compared to the sun, it's basically nothing. With a mass of 2 million trillion trillion kilograms, the sun makes up a staggering 99.8% of the total mass of our solar system. Big doesn't really cover it. And yet, the largest black holes in existence can reach 50 billion times the mass of our sun. If you were all powerful and a little bored, and you decided to pile copies of the sun on top of the world's largest set of scales at a rate of one every second, it would take you more than 1,500 years of non-stop work to rival the mass of the universe's biggest black holes. If that's hard to imagine, allow me to bring the scale down to human size. Well, rhino size. In terms of mass, the largest black holes in existence are, to the sun, what a rhinoceros is, to a grain of sand. Star Trek Fleet Command gives you the opportunity to engage in a story-driven Star Trek galaxy, where you can interact with famous characters from the next generation, the original series, the J.J. Abrams films, Discovery, and more. You play in a real-time combat open world, where you can battle alongside your allies to capture territory, pool resources and dominate the multiverse. And for a limited time, if you reach level 5 by the 10th of February 2022, you'll unlock a free Origins Burnham and the shards to tier up your Burnham to rank 2. I especially love the wide range of research trees that allows you to specialise your fleet, allowing you to conquer the multiverse story and bag those battle pass rewards along the way. Or if you're the kind of player who likes to go solo, be sure to check out Freelancer Mode, where you can travel the open world independently and play by your own rules. Either way, base building, space battles, quality graphics, and Spock, I'm all in. Don't forget, Star Trek Fleet Command is free to play on iOS and Android, so be sure to use my link in the description below to download it today. Happy trekking! Black holes of this size, called supermassive or sometimes ultra-massive black holes, are capable of swallowing entire solar systems as easily as you might accidentally swallow a fly whilst out for an evening jog. But as mind-bogglingly destructive as these intergalactic heavyweights are, recent research has suggested something rather surprising. There may well be planets orbiting some of the biggest, meanest black holes in the universe. Lots of them. So, how is that possible? And more importantly, could these planets harbour life? Whilst it might seem hard to believe that habitable planets could survive on the fringes of these terrifying giants, supermassive black holes aren't quite the intergalactic vacuum cleaners most people think they are. In fact, the idea that they mercilessly suck everything around them into their gaping moors is probably one of the biggest misconceptions in our small corner of the universe. Black holes don't suck at all. Objects are pulled towards them in exactly the same way you're currently being pulled towards the Earth, assuming you are indeed watching from Earth, through gravity. So long as you don't get too close, which isn't recommended, unless you like the idea of being turned into human spaghetti, the gravitational attraction of a black hole is exactly the same as that of a star of the same mass. If you were to wave that magic wand of yours and instantaneously replace the sun with a black hole of equal mass, 
it wouldn't suddenly devour the Earth and all the other planets. In fact, nothing would change at all. The planets would continue to happily orbit the black hole, as they'd previously orbited the Sun. Of course, we'd all die slowly and horribly as temperatures plummeted and the oceans froze over, but at least it would solve that whole global warming thing. So, there's no reason why planets couldn't happily orbit a supermassive black hole. The question is, do they? It's generally accepted that planets are formed in the giant clouds of dust and gas that encircle young stars. Over time, dust particles within these clouds, which are known as protoplanetary disks, bump into one another, and, if the collision isn't too violent, they stick together. Over time, those specks of dust become a little ball, which becomes a rock, which becomes a boulder, which eventually becomes something called a planetismal. When the chunk of space dust gets big enough, its own gravity begins to take over, attracting more dust and combining with other debris and planetismals until, eventually, it's big enough to qualify as a planet. And it turns out that some supermassive black holes are also orbited by swirling clouds of dust and gas, known as accretion disks that are in many ways quite similar to protoplanetary disks. Recent research suggests that under the right conditions, planets can form within a black hole's accretion disk in much the same way they do around stars. Of course, we're talking about two very different scales here. As we've seen, supermassive black holes are much bigger than stars, and so are the clouds of dust and gas that encircle them. That means there's a lot more building material to go around. And more building material means more planets. Like, a lot more. Upper estimates predict that a single supermassive black hole could form the center of a giant black hole system containing more than 10,000 planets. Well, not planets, exactly. For reasons that are quite hard to rationalise, it seems scientists have decided to call planets that orbit black holes, planets, with a B. I do wonder if any of them have noticed that we don't call planets that orbit stars, slanets. That's going to be an awkward meeting. Anyway, these planets could be strange indeed, with the largest being some 3,000 times more massive than Earth. That's about as big as a planet can get before it goes through a Pokemon-style evolution and turns into a brown dwarf. Okay, so now for the most important part. Could these colossal black hole systems and their unbelievably huge planets harbour life? Well, first, a disclaimer. Whilst I do consider myself to be relatively well-travelled, I haven't yet made it to a planet, so it's pretty hard to say for sure. But since the release of Christopher Nolan's Interstellar, a film that features a planet, or planet, called Miller's World that orbits a fictional supermassive black hole, scientists have begun to take a pretty keen interest in the topic. This isn't just some fun force experiment either. The habitability of planets could one day literally be the difference between life and death for our species but I'm getting ahead of myself. When searching for life out there in the far reaches of space, we humans tend to start by looking for planets with surface temperatures that could support liquid water. That's because, so far as we know, every single living thing in the universe requires liquid water to survive. Or at least everything on Earth seems to. We have liquid water here on our lovely big blue marble, thanks to heat from the sun. But planets orbit cold, unforgiving black holes instead of nice, cosy stars. So, of course, they're all just chunks of frigid rock and ice. Or are they? Actually, probably not. You see, it turns out there are a couple of other potential sources of energy near black holes that might just be able to provide enough warmth for liquid water to exist on a planet. It's never going to stop feeling stupid saying that word, is it? Whilst black holes themselves emit no light, it turns out the vicinity immediately surrounding them can be incredibly bright. You've probably already seen this now-famous picture. 
the first ever taken of a black hole. That glowing ring around the outside is the black hole's accretion disk. As matter from the accretion disk is devoured by its parent black hole, it's accelerated to truly mind-blowing speeds, as much as half the speed of light. At that kind of pace, the amount of energy released through friction is astonishing. If a planet happens to be the right distance away from a supermassive black hole, the accretion disk may be able to fulfill the same role the Sun does for us, providing enough warmth and light to support liquid water and therefore nurture life. That sounds great on paper, but there is one small problem. You see, accreting supermassive black holes are amongst the most luminous objects in the entire universe. The largest, known as quasars, can be thousands of times brighter than the 400 billion or so stars in the Milky Way put together. I'm going to say that again because, quite frankly, it's insane. A single black hole can shine with the light of thousands of galaxies. Quasars can also be incredibly hot. One that goes by the snappy name of 3C273 has been measured at 10 trillion degrees Kelvin. That's about 1.5 billion times hotter than the surface of the sun. So yeah, whilst an accreting supermassive black hole could potentially provide the warmth needed to sustain liquid water, it would probably be just as likely to melt any nearby planets to interstellar slag. Luckily, not all supermassive black holes come pre-packaged with world-ending accretion disks. And it's around these karma giants that another potential ice-melting energy source might come into play. But a uh, fair warning, things are about to get seriously weird. This mystery energy is the electromagnetic radiation left over from the Big Bang, otherwise known as the cosmic microwave background. The good news is the cosmic microwave background is the single biggest source of radiation in the entire universe by a very long way. It can be found literally everywhere. The bad news is it's extremely cold, just a few degrees above absolute zero, the same temperature as outer space. But here, physics has a trick up its sleeve. You see, as the cosmic microwave background is pulled into a black hole's gravity well, it becomes blue shifted, decreasing its wavelength and increasing its energy. Which means the closer you get to a black hole, the hotter the cosmic microwave background should feel. And it's possible that this weird phenomenon could create a kind of Goldilocks zone around a black hole that would be warm enough to support liquid water. Which is great. What's a little bit less great is that this Goldilocks zone, Baldilocks zone, is probably dangerously close to the black hole's point of no return, the event horizon. Here, the pull of gravity would be incredibly strong, and the only way for a planet to resist it would be to orbit that black hole extremely quickly, like practically the speed of light quickly. Whether or not that's even possible is highly debatable, and even if it is possible, it brings with it a whole other bunch of issues. Thanks to the weirdness of special relativity, both very high speeds and very strong gravity cause time dilation they literally make time slow down. Which means that time on a planet moving at close to the speed of light, just beyond the event horizon of a supermassive black hole, would move incredibly slowly. Potentially tens of thousands of times more slowly than it does here on Earth. That in itself isn't necessarily an issue. Time dilation is a relative effect. You only notice it if you compare the passage of time in two different places, meaning time always feels normal from your own perspective, even if you're experiencing extreme time dilation. But there's another, less obvious reason why time dilation on a planet could be an issue for life. In Interstellar, every hour on Miller's world was the equivalent of seven years back on Earth, 
That's a time dilation factor of about 60,000. As you may know, it took roughly 500 million years for life to emerge here on Earth. But for 500 million years to have passed on a planet with a time dilation factor of 60,000, the universe would need to be at least 30 trillion years old. And, uh, it isn't. So, yeah, even if life could exist on the kind of planet where the cosmic microwave background is hot enough to support life, and that's a very big if, it probably hasn't had time to evolve just yet. The truth is, whilst there's a reasonable chance giant black holer systems are out there, exactly what they might look like and whether they could ever harbour life is still very much an unknown. What we think we know so far is based on lots of assumptions, and if those assumptions turn out to be wrong, so will our conclusions. But, as I've already mentioned, whether or not life could exist on a planet isn't just idle speculation. It really could be life or death to us humans, one day in the near future. About 100 trillion years from now, star formation will end. Okay, so not exactly the near future. Anyway, a hundred trillion years from now, as the stars that remain begin to wink out one by one, the universe will go dark. When that happens, we humans won't have much choice but to head for the nearest black hole. After all, black holes will be the only place left to go, the last sources of energy in the dying universe. Whether or not we can actually survive when we get there is a pretty big deal. Okay, fine, maybe I'm getting just a tiny bit ahead of myself. It's not exactly a given that our species will make it through the next hundred trillion years, even the next hundred years, to be honest. But hey, it's always good to be prepared. Thanks for watching.